Hey everybody. everybody! So, this is gonna be the second year we actually do this video. Yeah. We're calling it our rereads and runners up because we wanted to, one, talk about more books we loved in 2020. Sure. And two, mention the books we reread this year, you know, and how they held up for us. Absolutely. Much. I mean, especially if, uh, me, I'm a notorious rereader. I'm so. not as prolific of pro rereader, but I do. And yet, reread yes, which means if it com it, it, if she comes back to it, that means it's absolutely like worth sort of mentioning. Mm -hmm. And and of course, runners up because there were more books. <laughs> it's like we couldn't help ourselves. There were more books. In which case, let's start with them runner ups, right? Okay. I think meaning they they weren't quite top fifteen material or even special mention material. Sure. But they did mean a little something, yeah. And that's just our short way of, you know, uh, uh, breaking down a thirty best books of twenty twenty list. Alrighty, I'm gonna start uh, with my first sort of like uh, set of, of runner uh, of runner ups that that really sort of like brightened twenty twenty up. I'm gonna start with um, just beyond the very far far north by uh, Dan Barrell. It's this Aww. really cute. Winnie That's the Pooh right. type thing, and uh, it's about Dwayne the Polar Bear. It is actually Aww. the second book in The Adventures of Dwayne the Polar Bear. And by adventures, I mean the stuff that happens around his the community. The very, very far north. The very, very far, far north. And the first book was, to me, just... It, it brought something, like, pure back mm -hmm. to the world. And I, I, I and, and one of the things that I commented, and uh, that Dan, Dan Barrell actually reached out to me on Goodreads in, in a couple of posts that he sort of posted some of my reviews, basically just appreciated as well, because I just really feel like this is one of those Winnie the Pooh type books, but for this generation. Oh yeah. And what makes this book arguably a better book than the first one is because they do a lot of growing up in this book. Oh, I have yeah, never, right. in the same way that, you know, like Tigger had to realize that he was gonna have to, you know, that his family was was already there. He didn't need yep. a whole bunch of Tiggers, and I'm talking about the Tigger movie. And Piglet realizing in mm -hmm. Piglet's big, big movie that yeah. he's everything he needs to be. That kind of growing up. Mm -hmm. Here, it's more about relationships. Like, how do I deal with it? And it was, it got so uncomfortable because these are the things that you want to shy away from. But mm -hmm. if everybody resolved relationship conflicts the way these Dwayne and his did. friends did, I would I would actually make kids read read, read this series like if I were a teacher I would put this on like like a bookshelf like a yeah. like a you know what are we reading and studying Aww. this year because it's life it's survi it's survival skills and that's why it Love deserves it. sort of like a runner up uh, spot up. the next one would be the Wicked and the Divine omnibus number four which is the is definitive the last, last collects absolutely everything else nothing more as far as we know that that puts an end to the series centering around a bunch of uh, gods. That a pantheon of gods, basically. Uh, a pantheon of gods that are that are reborn every X number of like decades. I think ninety years thereabouts. I forget at this point. So once reborn, are worshipped by the world for uh, several months, and then they all die, and the cycle starts again. And, uh, and the decades creep up, and they, then they're reborn. And it's gods from several pantheons across the across the globe. So you've got anything from Odin to Persephone to whatever, right? Uh, and, and different iterations as, as, as well. Lucifer is in there, which is super cool. And they kind of look like rock stars. And for me, it, it was a great end to, uh, to to a huge mystery. It's a rarity, honestly. It's, yeah, it's Kieran Gillen, so why not? <laughs> of course he would uh, br bring that bring that ship home quite nicely. I did not expect the ending, to, oh. to, to be honest. Oh, which that's is, surprising. Which is, which is the thing. It was not predictable. Uh, emotionally, maybe it was predictable because we wanted to, it's like, this can only end one of two ways. Uh, and it did. <laughs> It's just how we got there, I think, was I'm like, dang, that's how we, mm. Mm, that's kind of crazy. But it felt more like it just finished it already. Like, that's why it didn't make it to one of mm, my top. Gotcha. Like, it didn't blow my universe so much as I was like, good job, guys. Thanks for bringing it home. I just wanted to know what happened. Okay. So that, that's why gotcha, it's cool. Gotcha. And then last one before, so we move on to Alexa, would be the Rebirth series of Batgirl and the Birds of Prey. Back in the day, Birds of Prey was just Oracle because she had survived a nigh fatal shooting that the Joker mm. had put her through. And to recover herself and her life, she decided to fight crime on her wheelchair, be the central information's broker and hub of the entire superhero community whilst keeping her identity secret and working with a core group of, you know, women Black Canary, Huntress, the Birds of Prey. Mm -hmm. Now that Babs is not in the wheelchair anymore because they rebooted all of that yep. stuff and Gail Simone had come back to sort of put Batgirl back on her feet, literally, saw what I did there. Now it's Batgirl and the Birds of Prey because she's back on the field and yeah. still sort of leading and commanding and has her own like thing. Gotcha, gotcha. I have so many feelings about it, but one thing I do want to remember about it is that it has given me Birds of Prey feels that I have not felt in a while. Mm. 
I am not necessarily happy with how the entire series went, hence it's not in my top whatever. But the fact that it gave me moments, and at the end of the day, that's all we can ask for anyway. What is life if not just a series of moments that matter to us and that shape us? And that's why it, this is on a runners-up list. It gave me Makes some, sense. you know, this is my crew. And we gonna kill you. Well, kick your boot. They're not fatal. They, they, this is not kill the Suicide you. Squad. And we will, we will, we will execute justice in only the way that we can. So that was cool. Well, first of all, I'm gonna say that none of the things in this video are in any particular order for me. I know Mackie has his in, in order. Cause that's just how I roll. I like chaos. <laughs> Only in this so video. Explains Only in this why video. she married me. The first three books I'm going to talk about are actually all contemporary fiction, mostly contemporary nice. romance. That's so, it. the first book is actually one I read towards the end of the year The Twelve Dates of Christmas by Jenny Bayless. This is the most wholesome Christmas story I've read in a while. Uh, it's about a girl named Kate. She comes from a small village and she signed up to do this thing called The Twelve Dates of Christmas. It's a matchmaking service, basically. You fill in your profile, you pick the kind of date you want to go on, and they sort of match you, and you get to date someone different at each of these events. Yeah. And so Kate just wants, you know, she she's happy with her life and her career, and she just wants to find that person to be her person. And so she goes on the dates, there are a lot of shenanigans, and it is predictable who she's going to end up with at the earlier part of the book. You'll already figured out for sure but it's just so charming and wholesome there are a lot of holiday elements to it the whole 12 dates concept is very fun the atmosphere of this tiny village is so cute and i'm like it was just sweet and a perfect read for the holiday season so i would highly recommend the next book i'm going to mention is vanessa yu's magical paris tea shop by roselle lim it was just so fun to read it is about Vanessa who has this ability to sort of read someone's fortune in their tea leaves and she can't change those fortunes She can just read them after predicting a very tragic one for someone she's close to She's like I don't I don't want to do this anymore I don't want to keep seeing this anymore because it stresses her out And so when her aunt invites her to move to Paris so that the aunt can help her with her ability sort of like honing it and developing it a little bit and having control over it Vanessa jumps at the chance and so she ends up in Paris she ends up helping her aunt open the tea shop that her aunt wants to open in Paris and while she's there she might discover that you know maybe her perception of her power isn't necessarily how she should be taking it or looking at it and I just thought this story was so charming I really enjoyed seeing Vanessa you know work her way through like what she really felt about this power and this ability and what it has brought to her life and what it hasn't brought to her life and I also like you know just watching her grow into herself basically over the course of this book I will say the highlight of this story in particular is the Parisian setting I think Roselle does an amazing job capturing the vibe of Paris and the spirit of it and she also does an incredible job describing the food because I was so hungry the entire time I was reading this like how could I not end up liking this <laughs> book so yeah very enjoyable so much fun and the last awesome. book I'm gonna mention is one that I read early I got lucky and got to read it early but I read it early specifically because my friend DJ you might know him I mentioned him a lot on this channel uh, he told me I should read it and that book is The Roommate by Rosie Dannon uh. I thoroughly enjoyed this book it is a romance novel about a girl named Clara who moves cross country to be with like her childhood friend who is also her crush except that when she gets there her childhood friend is like oh bye gotta go my band is going on tour but don't worry I fixed your roommate situation for you and I got someone to you know take over for me it's while like, I'm gone however. and her roommate obviously they're complete strangers and then she eventually finds out that he actually is a part of the porn industry he's a porn star basically and this sort of is obviously a point of contention for them, but it is also a starting point for their relationship because they end up teaming up together to sort of get this business that they have in mind off the ground running. And it is a delightful journey. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was like laughing out loud so many times because this book is so funny. I mean, and just it has, the premise alone. Yeah, the shenanigans in it are hilarious. It is just a good time like I, this is the kind of book that could definitely see being adapted into a film so it's like, like it's, fun. Just, it's, it's just, just fun. the perfect it's setup fun. for it like it's they just fun. have to get the perfect couple to play the main couple and it'll be great so yeah i'm so glad dj pushed me to read this i would highly recommend it if you are looking for a new entertaining very quick fun romance read zero context but i'm suddenly imagining like the leads for the bridgerton series <laughs> that is i mean context. true true oh my gosh I mean, if you think about it... I gotta, I gotta tell DJ this. 
I'm just Moving saying. on, we'll, we'll throw the ball back to you <laughs> while I recover from this. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up my runners up uh, with a couple of things. So let's start with Katara and the Pirate Silver. Now that is a oh, I saw that. That, that is a standalone, as far as I know. It doesn't look like there's a volume two because it's sort of as a one shot deal. Mm -hmm. Set. I want to say before Zuko comes up. Uh, so it's oh, probably somewhere in. So it's probably somewhere in in in, in, in book two Earth when they were sort of like you know wandering around the Earth Kingdom. And, and, and Katara sort of just gets separated from the gang. But right before that, uh, so they sort of comment on, you know, it, like, you know how Toph is just blunt and she's like, I made Twinkle Toes learn earth bending in like, like a week, I like, Toph, okay. like three days or something like that. And Katara's like, and as opposed to little Miss Soft Serve, who uh, took her two weeks to get Aang to learn water bending. And, and she's like, and Aang's like, is that how, like, you know, is, is that how I am? Am I like soft? Am I like, and Aang's like, well, it's just different. Like, there was no definitive, like, affirmation that Katara's a badass. <laughs> Even if technically, reflection right there. Uh, he's an airbender. That's what they study. <laughs> but then Katara gets separated from the group, and she has no choice but to team up with a bunch of pirates. And it's great. I love it. It's such a great. I'm so glad that they didn't wait, like make this like because they could have easily made it one of those five page like you know sure. things where it's just this is this. But no, they made it a full fledged sort of like you know like one shot deal. And it's you know, for any fan of the Avatar series, you kind of put it on there. It's just, I needed more. That's why I didn't make it on uh, my top reads. Gotcha, gotcha. But but it has. But it is such a runner up because it just made me feel a lot of feelings. And Katara, you know, it, it adds more to like the the the, the building of K Katara's. Uh, like persona as a certified badass in her own right and I think this hidden story that happened behind the scenes uh, now on the forefront goes all right that, that, that that's another brick on the Katara as a badass like castle and that's lovely and then we've got the Donny Cates run of Thor uh, oh. volume one called the Devourer King oh, this I this deserves a follow-up because I don't really read Thor like a lot <laughs> I feel um, like, eh. I don't, I don't, I, I, that's the other thing too, I'm an X-Men guy. I will read anything X-Men before I will read anything Avengers. Sure. Uh, and Thor, mo least of all, probably, because it just, Asgard, it just never like, you know, the, the mythology never really resonated much with me. But what's cool here is that we find the Donny Cates run with Thor as the All-Father now. He's now officially on the throne of Asgard. And out of nowhere, Galactus, who is the world devourer, drops, literally almost half dead, into the middle of Asgard, right when Thor is at the peak of his, I guess, other warriors are going to have to do the fighting for me, am I still useful, blah blah blah. Mjolnir gets heavier and heavier every day. It's crazy. And consequently, Loki, on, on the other side of the, you know, realm, Nine Realms, is king of Jotunheim. Mm. Because, why not? He is the heir to Jotunheim, because he's a frost giant, uh, by blood. And Galactus is like, we need, like, there's something terrible is happening. Something terrible that it's trying to kill me. And Thor's like, I'll team up with you. And Galactus is like, cool, you're my new herald. And Thor's like, I am nobody's herald, but thanks for the cosmic power. So that was fun and, and super great. And Sif is now taking Heimdall's role and she's still sort of schooling everybody. Which, why wouldn't Sif do that? Like, so she's got like the, you know, the Bifrost and stuff. And she's like, Thor, you better sit your ass down and do your own thing. So well worth the mention. With my... Lastly, and again, I don't read Avengers stuff, but I do love Carol Danvers. There was a new, the new, the, the, the latest big crossover event that I've read that encom encompassed the entirety of the Marvel Universe was the Empire Saga. Mm -hmm. uh, long story short, old character that was set up canonically to potentially be the new big bad, and they were. The Avengers screw it up, and now we're all gonna die unless we stop the new bad guys, yeah. which is the Kotati Empire, plant-based. <laughs> sounds like, like a vegan, like, <laughs> sounds like a vegan food substitute. But they, but they are, they, they're bio, or, they are a bio-organic species sure. uh, and, and culture, but leaning towards uh, plant life and not mammalian life. Mm -hmm. um, and they are taking over the world all over again. At the center of it would be the Kree and the Skrulls, who have united for the first time in history. I don't have the time to get into all of that, but the fact that the Kree and the Skrulls have united and the, and the Avengers are once again in the middle of everything, uh, because their, of their new emperor, which is Emperor Doric, it, Hulkling from the Young Avengers, mm. and I love him so much, uh, you know, decides, all right, we're all friends now, I'm in charge now, and Carol Danvers, now that you're here, and because of your lineage as Kree, you're, we're gonna be the new accuser. And so she gets Ronan the Accuser's hammer, which is, it's not technically Ronan's, it belongs to the Accuser, whoever the role of Accuser is, and the hammer has like superpowers and stuff like that, so Carol is back in green for like a, a hot minute, and she does crazy things with the damn hammer! Uh, things that you totally, that only Carol would do. 
and 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 I love that. I am a huge Carol Danvers fan from way, 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 way back in the day. So just have her go. Yeah, I'm gonna do it my way. And and of course she and, 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 uh, and 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 recruit some of her friends. So she got her boyfriend Rhodey in on it too. Her best friend Jessica Drew, who I also love from like my childhood. Uh, randomly Hazmat uh, from from the from the Young Avengers. It's sort of involved uh, in, in this in all the show. And of course Doctor Strange to make it all happen. And I could almost hear Benedict Cumberbatch's voice going. Are you sure you want to do this? Like the exasperated, like, am I gonna have to? All right, fine, I will. So that was lovely, and and seeing seeing like sort of the new elements come together. So the last of my runner-ups, uh, the one I enjoyed the most because I liked the accused mini series within the Captain Marvel sort of like verse. It was cool. Cool. Okay, the last three runners-up I have are. They don't connect in any way, actually. I was trying to connect them, they don't. <laughs> uh, the first is a YA contemporary called Little Universes, and this is by Heather Demetrios. The basic premise of the story is that there are two sisters, they lose their parents in, a, in one of the terrible tsunamis that happens in Asia, and so they're forced to move from their home in California all the way over to Boston, if I remember correctly. And the story is basically about them dealing with their grief and the secrets that they're both keeping from each other in order to protect each other while they're grieving. I loved this book so much. It was really hard to read at times because it's never easy to read about someone going through grief and both of them were doing it in different ways too. Like it was it was hard on that aspect, but it was even harder because they were sisters and they were trying to do their best by each other because they were all, basically all they had left aside from like their extended family. It's a really powerful story. It's really well told. I loved the differences between the two siblings. I loved seeing them sort of work their way through what they were going through. And even though it got really hard and harrowing to read at times, like it was also just so poignant and so beautifully captured and I really enjoyed that. So would recommend, especially if you're in the right mind space for it. Otherwise, maybe just, you know, check out content warnings, trigger warnings before you check it out because there's a lot of stuff in that book that goes on. The other book that I don't actually have but I also really enjoyed is a book called Ever Cursed by Cory Ann Hedu. It's another book that has a lot of content warnings, trigger warnings, especially if you have suffered from, are suffering from, or are recovering from an eating disorder because that plays a big part in the book. In Ever Cursed, there are four princess sisters and they were cursed by a witch. Every time each one of them reaches, I want to say their 13th, it's either 11th or 13th birthday, the curse that's on them goes into effect and they lose something. So that's they terrible. lose their ability to love, they lose their memories, one of them loses her ability to eat. And oh, so no. it's this whole thing where this is the last year they have, it's the last chance they're gonna get to break the curse before it becomes a forever curse and it will stay with them forever. And so they end up teaming up with the witch who cast the curse in order to undo it. Oh. But what actually happens is that they realize there's something wrong in their kingdom and they're slowly uncovering what this That's wrongness cool. is and eventually at the end of the book they're all forced to confront it. And I thought it was really powerfully done. It was a book I read in one sitting because I could not put it down. I wanted to know what had happened. I'm always fascinated by stories that use fantastical elements to sort of portray things that feel thematically real and relatable to us. And this book did that extremely well. It was something that really just, you know, it sucker punched me basically. And I, not that I live for books like that, but I love books that have an impact yeah. like that. So that they land their point well. And I think that was great. That's so cool. cool. The last book I'm going to mention is actually going to be our seg into rereads because I had to reread a book in order to get to this book. That's good. I like that. So the reread was for The Dreadful Tale of Prosper Redding and then the book that's on the runner's up list is The Last Life of Prince Alistair. These are the two books in Alex Bracken's middle grade duology and they're delightful. Okay, I read them in October, which is the perfect time to read them because they are spooky. sort of spooky. The premise of The Dreadful Tale of Prosper Redding is that there is a character named Prosper Redding. He's pretty ordinary. He's considered pretty like low on the rungs of like the hierarchy of his family because he's not very talented in anything really in particular, except that you find out at the beginning of the book, he's got a demon bound inside him. Mm. And so this book is a race to get the demon out of him and also to protect him from his family who appear to have nefarious purposes right. in mind. It is basically shenanigans from book one all the way until book two. There's a lot of like uncovering the secrets that the family has kept and also figuring out the different relationships with the members yeah. of the family and the demon himself. And what I like is there are two character journeys you're following. You're following Prosper's journey, sort of with him coming to deal with the extraordinary circumstances he's in and having to sort of stand up and embrace his personality and his own power to change those circumstances. And to protect the thing that he loves, which is his twin sister. There is also Alistair's character journey where he is just determined to like be free 
and go back to his kingdom and rule over the kingdom because you know that's, as we that, all do that's just what he wants as and, we uh, all do it is magical mayhem at its finest magical mayhem middle grade style at its finest i should say i have a slight preference for book two over book one just because book two has more of a journey quest aspect to it and i love those and you're exploring a completely different setting which i really enjoyed but the thing that really made these books for me is the fact that i love alistair as a character i kid you not he reminds me so much of mackie like whenever i whenever i was reading the book and he would make a particularly quippy remark i'm like that's, that's I Mackie's married brand that. of humor right there. I married that. And so that was very entertaining to me. I also think the resolution oh. is pretty solid. Like it lands perfectly. Yeah. So I would highly recommend checking that out. Awesome. All right. In which case, great segue to the rereads. Why, I'm going to start with my first three sort of like big rereads. So really, really quick shout out to the Boruto series because I had to also reread it <laughs> in order to get to sort of like what was part of my actual sort of like top 20 sort of like reads and the only thing i do want to say about this okay so for those of you who have watched the naruto series it's set in a world where shinobi are sort of like the biggest military and power i want to say uh for for big countries uh, each big country has a small hidden village of ninjas basically and they train their children from a very young age it's all, i mean it's all very child soldier if you think about yeah, it actually this takes place after the great big uh probably the fourth great big uh shinobi war that did the one thing that nobody ever thought could be done was to unite the entire world against an actual threat that mm -hmm. wanted to sort of like topple it, ushering an era of peace. So these are peacetime children okay. raised in a different, uh, you know, in, in an environment. environment that was arguably less, in, in the board studio, arguably less stringent or, or volatile, I want to yeah. say, which gives them a, a unique disadvantage against the new threat that is coming. Fair. But What's great about that, because obviously you would think they were just cannon fodder now yeah. compared to like the stronger previous sure. generation because of the wars, but that's actually not the story. And what 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 I wonderfully discovered reading the rest of this is, but it, it's a story. It's still about family, mm. and more so on the nose. And in this first couple of uh, books, uh, volumes four and five, actually set that up really well, mm. and really add to that. You know, kind of like this is a great stepping stone into this is what we're trying to tell and it's great and it's lovely and if you love Naruto and, and Naruto Shippuden you're gonna want to probably pick Boruto up the manga maybe not so much the 200 episode tv series that's already sort of been out and has all of the criticisms but you're gonna want to stick to the source material because gotcha. it's actually pretty good all right well to me moving on right along I reread the red series so red is uh retired retired extremely dangerous God damn, she knows. Red is means, right? as Alexa had reminded me, yes, is okay. retired, extremely dangerous. And it centers around Frank Moses, who is, uh, who was formerly of the CIA and one of the best wet works, you know, murderers that the CIA has ever had to offer. He sort of develops a crush on, on like, the the lady who's sending oh, yeah, him his pension that. checks. That was so cute. But, but then when he realizes that forces from his past he has no idea he's liquidated so many you know threats somebody seems to be cleaning up their tracks and lord knows which which one of which one is. of which whether it's an outside force or an inside force point is they are starting to eliminate well they tried to eliminate him and they're going to eliminate anyone he knows and since they've seen him call this unassuming little sort of like you know <laughs> friend who is, you know, his like confidant. The Bruce Willis movie, by the way, is just superb. I it's mean, Helen Mirren is in it. It's just magnificent. So I reread the entire saga of Frank Moses and also like the little, you know, the prequels, everything. It's great. It's a lovely concept. I the, the graphic novels are a little darker, obviously, but I watched it in tandem with the movies because the movies give it that levity mm -hmm. that the graphic novels just sort of True. don't afford. Uh, but yeah, just I love the concept. Retired, mm -hmm. extremely, extremely dangerous. dangerous. Just a bunch of old assassins. So when he has to like rally the troops, everyone he ad rallies, like, you're gonna kill me. It's like no, 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 no. This is I need your help. Okay, cool. You know, it's like they know the game. It's kind of like it's kind of like how Natasha Romanov and uh, and Clint Barton on in Civil War were like, we're still friends, right? Just like depends on how hard you hit me. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. And and finally, finally, before we you know throw the ball back, I'm gonna go with Cinderella. Uh, from Fables. Oh, okay. Um, Cinder I was like Cinderella. The fairy Cinder tale? So, so Cinderella actually is, is a character from the from the from the series Fables. Bill Wilmingham, super super like pr uh, prominent at the time. Fables are actually real, but because they were driven out of their particular homelands of different fables, the Three Little Pigs, Snow mm -hmm. White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, all of those guys, and apparently just the one Prince Charming, because he's just the same dude everywhere. He's, so annoying. Well, sorry, the he's the same jackass. He's the same jackass princely f-boy like in every like every single one of the marrieds charming 
because it's just him, like because yeah. that's what he does best next to next to fencing. So so that was a great thing. They ran away from their home. That's cool. Cinderella actually owns a shoe store. Yeah. To nobody's surprise, in Fable Town. But to everyone's potential surprise, she is actually Bigby Wolf, the big ba the big bad wolf, who is the sheriff of Fable Town. He she is actually his wet works agent. And Cinderella is great. and Cinderella is basically a spy story because she is basically Fable Town's top spy. She's a Natasha Romanoff of Fable Town, and her job is to make sure that none of the fable like stuff is trafficked into the mundane world. So whenever they get any news of like an artifact from the Arabian Nights like thing, or an artifact from like Pinocchio like lore or whatever. She has to go out and go, okay, you guys have to stop trafficking black market goods that are actually fables, oh, fable owned or fable made. Like, stop it. And she just eliminates the threats. And because, so they're all, and because they're all immortal, Cinderella actually spans several decades. That's so fun. And it's just great. Hence, of course, it's a great reread. I enjoyed it so much. It reminded me of how rich the lore of the fable series actually is. So that's kind of cool. Okay, continuing on with the rereads, I'm just going to talk about two since I technically talked about Prosper Reading already. That's right. We're going to start with The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I'm Ooh only boy. holding up book three because this is my favorite from the reread. When I say The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, I only mean the first four books, which I read over and over again as a teenager. The one thing that still holds up for me about this series is the friendship between our four main characters. Basically, The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, if you didn't already know, is the story of four friends. They have known each other all their lives, and the first book, they're going to be spending their summers apart from each other for the first time ever. And the thing that is going to connect them are, you know, not only their phone calls and letters, but they have this pair of pants that was thrifted that magically fits all of them, even with their very different body types. And so they use the pants sort of to hold them together. And I love that this series explores like four years worth of that. You get to see them like, you know, growing up, having to deal with very different real life situations, but also at, in the end coming together for each other. And I think that's always been my favorite part of the series. So I definitely wanted to give it a shout out. Although I will say that some other things about the series don't necessarily hold up very well. Like some of the plot lines are a little weak. Some of the romances are kind of questionable and some of the characters actually act out more than I remember them doing. But that is probably because I'm looking at it from the lens of an adult now, not as a teenager. So there's that. I also reread the entirety of the Bridgerton series in preparation for the Netflix show that came out in December. This is also my favorite book in the series because I did not want to hold up all eight. The Bridgerton series centers around a family of siblings. There are eight of them, so each one gets a book in the series. They're all historical romances, and for me, my favorite part of them is that there is a huge family aspect to them. They're also very light in terms of the angst, so it's more historical rom-com than anything else. I will say some of the books did not hold up as well as I would have liked upon this reread. There are a lot of things that I probably did not really understand very well or completely, or that you know just went over my head when I read them in my younger years. And reading them now as an adult, I can see those faults in it. But I will always have a nostalgic love for the series just because I love the Bridgerton clan so much. And I love that this author chose to like tell eight different love stories that span one family and to throw in that family sibling dynamic and the dynamic with their mom as well through the course of the series. So definitely wanted and to And now we have a out. show. Yeah, actually those by Reeridge are kind of in order, so I guess we're just gonna keep going in order. No, you can tell them your top three. <laughs> right, rounding up my top three rereads of pretty much all time. I'm gonna have to go with X23. Mm -hmm. And and I'm talking about OG, like this is Laura Kinney, who is the clone of Wolverine. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who've watched the Logan film, there's a the lovely, little lovely little girl there who murders people. <laughs> Uh, quite I love her like a lovely little girl. She's she murders. She people. does though, and, and 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 with such a savagery that you're like, oh, look at her. I thought it was cute. She's lovely. X twenty three. Uh, the, the the sort of like the OG story of Laura sort of like escaping the facility. You see her from you know the, from from when she's like sort of has like knowledge of herself. It actually starts off with Captain Mary sort of interrogating her. I want to mm -hmm. say, and I always love. I always appreciate a story when Cap is is clearly on the wrong side of things and is blindsided and it's actually Matt Murdock yeah. and it's actually Matt so there's that contrast of okay what happened and this sort of re retells sort of this is how I grew up this is whatever uh, all the way to like the terrible terrible sort of ending where tragedy just really again if you're basically a Wolverine your life is crap like none of your relationships will last and the only time that that has changed is a little bit towards the end when you know 
her lore grows and there are other clones and now they're all on Krakoa and everybody's fine and playing, you know, claw roulette or I don't, I don't, I don't make these things up, but they'll survive. They'll survive. It's like, all right, your turn. You know, if you lose the bottle, it's like click and I just, you know, you'll, you'll heal. It's weird. And now they're all one happy murder baby family. <laughs> Read it if you love X-23, if you've never heard of her, if you want to see what more of her stuff. This is, I think, the closest thing to... Uh, I wish they made a movie out of it. Okay. That's my deal. I'm gonna have to, you know, go with Rogue Squadron. I had to unearth uh, this particular copy of mine because I had bought, like, the series secondhand on eBay because I just needed to bring... I couldn't bring my collection here when I moved. But then when I saw that eBay, like, had it, I'm like, I'm taking it out, I'm putting it out on my shelf. It is from the... Like, this is a book from... Uh, clearly, it's an old version. It doesn't say Legacy on it. Still salty, still so like it, that's enough salt in there to to season uh, roast. And it, it tells the story of Wedge Antilles mm -hmm. after I want to say the Battle of Endor and a f and a few other sort of like pivotal battles where Coruscant has not yet fallen mm. in the Legends universe. And now Rogue Squadron, the survivors of which Wedge being the only one officially back on active duty, are, are collecting a new set of, of pilots in order to be literally the spearhead that'll allow the New Republic to drive the Empire out of the core worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. And it is, uh, and it brings in a bunch of new characters. Uh, there's a lot of heavy-handed allusions to the main story, like Han would have, like, yeah, like Wedge and Han are, like, really that good friends. Sure, they're both Corellians, why not? But, you know, and they were both sort of on the smuggling side of things. To have new characters come in, uh, it's just, it's such a great space drop. It takes pilots and special ops and a little bit of the force, uh, well, you know, as it all directs us, <laughs> and, and, and just impossible missions. Rogue Squadron is the squadron that does the impossible. And what is more impossible right now if not to retake Coruscant for the Republic and defeat what what is rumored to be have been the emperor's like lover or whatever but it's actually at the time the emperor was alive head of imperial intelligence uh, izan icehard is the big bad here she has like one blue eye and one red eye and in a, in a in a weird kind of like badass heterochromic kind of like situation just like graying forelocks formidable formidable uh, enemy imperial intelligence and she is basically the super spy she's like the nick fury of of the empire and that's bad news for the Re for the rebels that are now the new republic. And Rogue Squadron is the spear that will pierce the Empire's heart mm. of ice. Anyway, on that, I want to end with the Immortals Quartet. I want to, again, I couldn't bring my collection back, but this is a book that is pretty much like the first set of books that I actually let Alexa. And the first books that I got, I remember reading Tamar Pierce. The protector of the small first, which is terrible. That's like the 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 the. the it's the, like it's spoiled. That's like, that's it's like magnificently spoiled. It spoils it everything. It's the ninth book, and I read it for the first time, and I'm like, there's and so and right after I read it, I loved it so much. I bought every single book in the world of Tor uh, Tortal, and I realized, oh my god, I just like I just got spoiled for everything. I know what happens now, <laughs> for everything. But this uh, particular piece has made me feel something that no other Tortal book has made me feel. Because Dane actually is not from Tortal. She's not from that world. It, she, she comes from sort of like a neighboring country and is brought into the central world of Tortal where you've got a, a king who is just down to earth and a queen who is, has her own band of riders and warriors because she is a warrior. And Tortal is a group of people who doesn't do kingdoms the way everybody, every kingdom does kingdoms. And for Dane to go, this is crazy. Who are you guys? What do you do? This is so strange. And so to, for her to find a place in a world of misfits, being a misfit herself, she thinks the queen of all misfits because she has a terrible power that she doesn't understand. It's so beautiful and I have never felt this this sensation of coming home more. So I must have sobbed through this entire book reading it this year because it really just felt like a homecoming. And I felt for, mm -hmm. and, and what with 2020 being the year that it was, Tell me about to it. find, I, I don't even feel this homesick to, with my, with with, with 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 Manila, but but this is like this is home. Like this is I haven't felt like this since Konoha really from the Naruto series. Felt great. Oh, I highly recommend. Even if you start with this one, but why would you start with Alana? Alana. Um, I could a lot of you know a lot of the first adventure. Start with that. But even if you did start with this, it's still a great introduction. It's still a great introduction. So do read that. Tamara Pierce, one of my favorite writers of all time. Check out her stuff.
check out her stuff. All right, we're down to my last three rereads that I'm going to talk about. The first one is going to be the first book I read in 2020, Boy, look at how actually. gorgeous this is. And this is The Secret Garden, which is by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This is the beautiful Mina Lima edition, which I did read. I love the experience because it actually has interactive elements. You can kind of see the colored pages there. The Secret Garden is not without its faults, to be fair, but it is also a classic that was written quite some time ago. It's the story of a young girl named Mary Lennox. She is orphaned when a lot of people in her life, including her parents, take, take ill and die in India. And so she's sent back to England to live with an uncle she's never met, and he happens to live in a very isolated house on the moors. While she's there, she goes exploring, discovers that there's a walled garden that is locked up and no one will tell her why or how to get into it. And so... She decides to she unlock decides it. She decides to find a way to unlock it to see what's in behind those walls, basically. I'll leave it at that. I guess you probably are familiar with the story, especially if you've seen the movie. There is a new one and there's also an older one that I'm sure many of us grew up watching. I will say I loved revisiting the story. This was a story that I held near and dear to my heart as a child. There's just something about the way the atmosphere is written into the story. The setting is so... You can feel the setting being written into the story. And I love the whole aspect of magic in it as well. Uh, that was something that I had totally forgotten about, I think, in detail until I reread it again. And that part to me just like really resonated. Again, like I said, not without its fault, but that's also because of the time period and the society that this writer was living in. But it's still such a charming childhood nostalgic read for me. I think it's one that I would always go back to and revisit just because it means so much to me in a way that I did not expect it to. I'm also gonna mention a reread that I loved. It was so good to reread this book. It has been like six years, I think, since the last time I read oh it. Boy. And that is Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. This book is just as magical as it was the first time I read it. It's set, it is set in Prague, and it centers around a main character named Karu. She happens to live straddled between the real world and the fantastical world. Real world because she's still a student studying in school. Fantastical world because she was basically adopted by a bunch of chimera when she was very young and kind of has the ability to use some things to make wishes. The story escalates when the natural enemy of the chimeras, the angels, mm. sort of make a play and end up burning all the passageways to the world where the chimera Ooh, live in, um, decimating them. and. An angel comes into Karu's life and it turns out that he might actually have more ties to her than she would ever have known. Uh -huh. I'm doing a terrible job describing it, but trust me when I say it's one of the best fantasy books I've ever read. Not only is the setting and the world building exquisite, Lainey Taylor's writing is also just beautiful. Like she has a way with words and she tells a story that really, it's a slow build. It starts very like unassuming, kind of small in scope and nature, and then it builds and builds and builds until you get to that final big moment where everything falls into place and clicks and it's just so well done. I'm still in awe of how she does it. Don't know how she does it. Very magical, very good. Definitely check it out. And the last three reads I'm going to mention are actually all in the series and I can't pick one of the books because I love the entire experience of reading So let's this. just put it all so together. So we're just going to show it to you. These are the first three books in the Bone Season series by Samantha Shannon. I also read the pamphlet and the two novellas that are in this series as well. I just, I've forgotten how much I love this series. There's just something, again, it, it's very similar to how I felt about Daughter of Smoke and Bone. I think Samantha Shannon also has a gift for storytelling. She literally immerses her reader into this world that feels so believable and feels so real. And I'm not usually a big, like, sort of dystopian reader, even if it's fantasy dystopian, but for some reason, the way that she set up this world with the whole idea of clairvoyance and the whole like magical aspects to it just really worked for me. I love that it is a combination of like each book having its own individual conflict to it, but there is this big overarching conflict that informs everything else that is going on, and I really like that. Again, like most of the authors that I ex like admire greatly, Samantha Shannon is also really good at characters. She has a huge cast of characters in her books, and she somehow manages to make you either like or dislike all of them, depending on the context. Huh. She's just so good at it. Like Every single book opens up the world a little more, which is not a feat that many authors can accomplish. And I think she does it so successfully where I'm just like, and then what? And then what? Even when I'm in pain already from what's going on, I'm like, and then what happens? And then what goes on? And I'm just, 
it's just so good. It still holds up so well on a reread. I would definitely recommend checking it out, honestly. Like, the first book is great, but as the series progresses, it just keeps getting better. And, like, that is such a rarity in a book series. And I'm there just excited go. for whatever comes next, which is The Mask Falling, which also decimated me. <laughs> great. Anyway, we have now reached the end of our rereads and runners up video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have read, any of these books or you want to share your own favorite rereads favorite runners up for the year yeah we'd love it if you do in the comments and we'll see you guys in a new video soon bye